Hi. The future of machine learning and AI is self-supervised. One question I've been asking myself for many years is how do humans and animals learn? In particular, how do they learn so quickly, uh, seemingly not requiring any supervision or very little and uh, almost no interaction with the world? This is a chart put together by Emmanuel Dupou that shows at what age babies learn basic concepts like object permanence, stability, and intuitive physics, inertia, gravity, and things like this. Uh, this seemingly is uh, being learned almost with no interaction with the world, mostly by observation. Uh, the, the young babies have very little ability to interact uh, directly with the world. And the mystery is um, how does that happen? And how does it happen in uh, animals as well? Uh, this is probably the vehicle through which uh, baby animals and humans learn massive amounts of background information about the world, such as intuitive physics and things of that type. Uh, perhaps the accumulation of this knowledge uh, forms the basis of common sense. So being able to reproduce this type of learning in machines would be uh, uh, enormously, enormously powerful, would uh, reduce the requirement for label samples and trials. And in my opinion, the next revolution in AI will uh, not be supervised nor reinforced. Um, so there are really kind of three challenges in uh, deep learning AI and machine learning today. Um, one is, of course, diminishing the requirement for label samples and reinforcement uh, uh, interactions. Uh, and in my opinion, that goes through self-supervised learning, as I just mentioned. Self-supervised learning really is learning dependencies between variables, learning to fill in the blanks, uh, learning to represent the world, learning to predict. The second one is learning to reason, uh, going beyond system one, uh, Daniel Kahneman's system one, which is uh, not going through kind of a fixed uh, number of steps in a feed-forward neural net, but being able to sort of reason perhaps by uh, finding a configuration of uh, variables that satisfy a certain number of constraints or minimize some sort of energy or maximize some uh, likelihood. And the third one is uh, learning to plan complex action sequences. And I don't have much to say about this, unfortunately. So what is self-supervised learning? Self-supervised learning is learning to fill, the, fill in the blanks. Uh, let's take an example of a video. You, the, mach the machine pretends not to know a piece of that video and train itself to predict the piece that it pretends not to know from the piece that it knows. So for example, predicting the future from the past, uh, predict, predicting the top from the bottom, predicting missing frames, things like that, or missing words in the text, as is, of course, uh, becoming very popular. Um, so um, the problem with this is that the prediction must be multimodal. There is no single prediction that will be consistent with an initial segment of a video. Multiple future of the video are, are possible. Uh, so we cannot use just uh, a neural net that is basically a deterministic function symbolized by this sort of rounded shaped blue uh, uh, block here, g of x, uh, which makes a single point prediction. We have to replace this by something that can make multiple prediction. And one way to do this is to go through some an, an implicit function that basically measures the compatibility between the variable we observe, x, and the variable we need to predict, y. So this uh, function, f of xy, uh, we'll take low values is if x and y are compatible with each other, and higher value if y is incompatible with x, if it's not a good continuation for the video, for example. Um, the symbolism I'm using here is very similar to uh, factor graphs in uh, graphical models, except for this extra symbol of deterministic function. Now, I'm going to advocate to use energy-based models, uh, which you know basically measure the compatibility between x and y through this energy function. Again, that takes low value if x and y are compatible and higher value if, uh, if they're not. Uh, inference uh, is performed by, uh, for a given x, finding y's that minimize this energy. Uh, there could be multiple y's. Uh, and this is a way of uh, handling uncertainty without resorting to probabilities. Um, inference can be done if the function f is smooth in y space, can be done through uh, gradient-based uh, uh, optimization algorithms or some other uh, inference uh, methods. Uh, of course, is why is discrete is much easier and we don't have to deal with that. Um, there are conditional and, and unconditional versions of energy-based models. In conditional version, the variable x is the one that's always known and y is the one that's always needs to be predicted. In the unconditional version, uh, the, the trick here is to train the machine to predict part of y from, part, from other parts of y, but we never know which one is known, which one is unknown. Uh, so this is sort of a 
capturing the mutual dependencies between the, the variables as uh, symbolized by the, uh, the drawing here on the, uh, uh, on the left, on the bottom left, that, that represents uh, energy function in this case here learned with k-means where the, the training samples are drawn on this little uh, uh, purple uh, curve. Um, so one way to handle multiple outputs is to is through the use of a latent variable. So uh, if we're going to build our machine out of uh, deterministic functions, the the way to allow a machine to produce multiple outputs for a single input is to parameterize the set of outputs through a latent variable. So the typical architecture would look something like this. You have an X variable that goes through a predictor that extracts a representation of that X variable. And that representation together with a latent variable go through a decoder which produces the prediction. When you vary the latent variable over a set, it makes the prediction vary over uh, a set of uh, similar dimension. And the trick, of course, is to find, uh, uh, build a machine and train it in such a way that the latent variable represent independent explanatory factors of variation of the output. Um, the information capacity of this latent variable must be minimized or regularized. And this is a main issue that I will discuss uh, later. Um, now, many energy-based models are actually uh, built using latent variables, and you can uh, reduce a uh, latent variable energy-based model to one that doesn't have one by either marginalizing or minimizing with respect to the latent variable. So uh, inference, of course, uh, takes place by minimizing the elementary energy function with respect to both y and z, the variable to be predicted and the latent variable. But you can simply redefine the energy function f by minimizing the elementary energy function E with respect to Z, or by marginalizing, which is equivalent to computing some sort of free energy, uh, as indicated here, uh, the logarithm of the integral of exponential minus the energy where the integral takes place over the domain of Z. Uh, but this may turn out to be uh, impractical or intractable or only approximated through variational methods uh, in practice. So um, an example of a latent variable, let's say, or data manifold is an ellipse. Uh, what we, um, when we find a data point, we need to compute its energy by finding the point on the manifold that is closest to it so that we measure the distance to the manifold. And the latent variable would be the angle uh, that leads to the point, the closest point on that manifold. Uh, now, in this simple case, of course, you can write it explicitly, but in more complex cases, uh, of course, we need to find this manifold and the parameterization is non-trivial. Okay, so how do we train energy-based models? What we need to do is make sure the energy for data samples is lower than the energy outside uh, of the data manifold. Um, and um, there's two types of methods for this. Contrastive methods that explicitly push down on the data points and push up on other points outside the data manifold or maybe on it, but less uh, strongly. And then there is regularized and architectural methods that essentially limit the volume of space uh, in, in Y space that can take low energy and therefore kind of shrink wrap the uh, data manifold uh, automatically without having to push up. So we're going to explore uh, some of those. I make a big list here. I'm not going to read through all of this, but a big list of classical methods that can be interpreted in, the, in this context, either as contrastive methods or architectural method. Uh, maximum likelihood in, in um, uh, uh, distributions that are not easily normalized is actually uh, part of contrastive methods. Uh, and um, uh, which is what I'm, I'm going to talk about first. So there is an issue with probabilistic methods, which you can, of, of course, uh, almost always turn an energy function into a probability distribution using a Gibbs distribution. And you can do maximum likelihood. But you basically have to do maximum likelihood if you want estimates of densities. The problem is that estimating densities is not necessarily a good idea. Because uh, by doing maximum likelihood, what the system wants to do is give the lowest possible energy to data points and the highest possible energy to, point, to points just outside of the data manifold, um, which leads the system to create to creating uh, extremely deep, narrow canyons. And those are not uh, particularly useful for inference. We need smooth functions. So those functions would need to be regularized, for example, by a prior or another regularizer. Um, but then we lose the advantage of actually estimating densities. We're not estimating densities anymore. So why not throw away uh, the probability framework altogether and just learn dependency through an energy function? 
So uh, throwing away the, the probabilistic framework sort of allows us to uh, use more freedom in sort of deciding on what uh, objective function to use. Um, the characteristic of the objective function is that it must be a, an increasing function of the energy of data points and a decreasing function of the energy of points outside the data manifold, and perhaps through some sort of margin that depends on those two points. Uh, there are several forms for those energies. I'm not going to go to the details, but they've been used in various contexts over the over the years, either for things like Siamese networks or metric learning, uh, or for ranking or um, or, or embedding. Um, and then more recently, there's been an objective function that used not just a pair of points, but uh, a whole set of points that are either uh, positive or contrastive, so points on the manifold or outside. Uh, so a good example of this is noise contrastive estimation, which is very popular now in uh, sort of uh, embedding methods, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a minute. Um, so obviously, there's very successful applications of uh, self-supervised learning today, in particular in the context of natural language processing. Everybody knows about uh, BERT. Uh, this was preceded by the colbert weston set of techniques, uh, which used uh, a form of denoising autoencoder where you take an input, you corrupt it, and then you train the system to distinguish between the clean version and the corrupted version. In denoising autoencoder, you train the system to map corrupted version to clean versions. Therefore, now the reconstruction error for corrupted uh, points is the distance between the corrupted point and this clean version. And so you have automatically an energy surface that grows with the distance to the manifold as represented here on the bottom uh, right. Uh, this represents the vector field of uh, the, basically the gradient field of the energy function uh, produced by um, denoising autoencoder. So this has been incredibly successful in the context of NLP. Uh, the problem is, uh, it doesn't quite uh, work in the context of images, and, and there's been sort of a lot of work in trying to sort of use self-supervised learning to learn good features in images. And it's only in recent years that those systems have been, uh, those attempts have been somewhat successful at actually giving good features. They're based on uh, uh, what's called contrastive embedding or Siamese networks. The idea is you show uh, a system uh, an image X and the image uh, Y that would be compatible to it would be a distortion of that image that doesn't basically change its content. And you train the networks to produce uh, 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 similar outputs, similar vectors, or perhaps even identical outputs. And then the contrastive, the contrastive samples consist of, of showing two images that are, are different and then pushing the two vectors uh, apart. Uh, there's been successful applications of this to face recognition but Tagman et, et al. Uh, many years ago, but um, and, and earlier examples of Siamese net for various applications. More recently, though, uh, the techniques Pearl by, by Ishan Mishra, Moko by Kai Ming Hun, his collaborators, and SimClear by the team uh, from Google have shown that you can learn uh, good visual features using those techniques. However, um, the cost, the computational cost of these methods is very high because there's many ways to be different, for two images to be different. And for this to succeed, the amount of computation and training is absolutely enormous, even for relatively small data sets. So I think ultimately those methods actually are not the best um, and uh, won't, won't scale to really very, very large uh, representation vectors. You can interpret GANs also as um, uh, um, contrastive methods, uh, basically where the, the data points are, are pushed down, particularly the, the sort of energy-based formulation of GANs, energy-based GANs, where you push down on the energy of data points and then you push up on the energy of chosen points and those points are generated by the generator network that is trained to produce points that progressively get closer to the manifold so as to shape the energy function. Now, GANs can use any kind of uh, objective function as long as, again, it's a decreasing function of the data points and an increasing function of the generated points. And there is some sort of margin that you can guarantee. Um, so a lot of classical algorithms can be interpreted in the context of energy-based learning. Um, uh, uh, and here I'm going to talk about a few architectural and regularized methods, particularly regularized methods. So the idea of regularized uh, latent variable method is to regularize the volume of stuff that can take uh, low energy, the volume of Y space uh, uh, that uh, can take low energy. And you do this by regularizing the information capacity of a latent variable. A good example of this is sparse coding. Um, so 
that's the that, that's the principle I'm gonna. Uh, so this is uh, 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 sparse coding and and kind of and sparse autoencoders and variational autoencoders interpreted in the context of uh, regularized latent variable methods. So in the context of sparse coding, you linearly reconstruct a vector uh, by uh, finding a, a, a vector, uh, a latent vector that is sparse, kind of minimizes a particular uh, regularizer here, the L1 norm. Um, and then you can train the decoder to uh, maximally reconstruct uh, training samples. The thing is, uh, because the capacity of the latent variable is limited, there's only a limited volume of white space that the system can exactly or properly reconstruct. And so automatically, when you make the energy low at certain points, it becomes high outside. Um, similarly, for regularized autoencoders, so regularized autoencoders are autoencoders where, the again, the information capacity of the latent code is limited, either through sparsity or something similar, or by adding noise to it. So the, the, the idea of variational autoencoders is just to add noise to the, to the code and to limit the amplitude of the codes so that the information capacity overall of the code is, uh, is limited. And you can interpret them as uh, a latent variable uh, uh, energy-based model in which you uh, approximately sample the latent variable through, um, uh, 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 I mean, you approximately integrate uh, or marginalize over the latent variable uh, through sampling. Um, so those techniques uh, uh, work very well with simple decoders. And uh, I think a, a, a big uh, challenge of the next few years is to try to make them work with sort of deep uh, representations uh, as well. Now, there are other types of regularization that uh, lead to kind of good representations, in particular uh, things that exploit uh, a graph of similarity or perhaps uh, a temporal continuity. So things like uh, learning uh, uh, temporally invariant uh, representations or making them linearly predictable. Uh, this is work by uh, my student, uh, Ross Goroshin, a few years ago, or by minimizing the, the curvature of the trajectory followed in the representation space. Uh, this is work by Olivier Naff. Um, for his PhD at NYU. Um, and uh, having sort of decoders uh, to reconstruct from the input alleviates the need to have contrastive samples. Uh, again, this works really well. It learns really beautiful features. It's not clear that those features are useful in sort of a deep uh, convolutional net context yet, uh, but that's again a challenge for the next few years. Um, so we can use conditional versions of those uh, systems to do video prediction and perhaps uh, get machines to learn some structure about the world. Uh, so a good example of this is some work that we published at iClear a couple of years ago, which consists in learning one of those variational autoencoders or regularized autoencoder, conditional autoencoder type architecture to predict what cars around you are going to do. Um, so to be able to learn a policy for driving, it's good to be able to predict what cars around you are going to do. And of course, it's not deterministic, so uh, you have to have a latent variable model so that you can vary the latent variable um, uh, to make multiple predictions. Uh, this system used a combination of variational autoencoder type uh, sampling as well as another regularization that uh, is basically equivalent to um, global dropout. So half the time we tell the system, your latent variable is zero, make the, mess, the, make the best uh, prediction possible. So these are the result. You get blurry predictions if you don't use a latent variable. But you get much better prediction shown on the right here by sampling the latent variable with different values. You get sort of realistic predictions that are all very different. Uh, on the left here is the recorded uh, video. Um, we are using this, in fact, to train a forward model of the world. So the, the, the trick here is to um, have a way of predicting what the world is going to do that you can use in the context of a model predictive control uh, system. Uh, this is not reinforcement learning because everything is differentiable, uh, including the objective function, the cost. So we uh, estimate the state of the world, run our forward model. This is not the real world. This is our model. It's differentiable. It's a neural net. Um, and for each new state, uh, we give it a proposal uh, action, and we sample a latent variable not represented here. We can compute the cost. And through backprop, we can train a policy network to learn to generate an opti optimal sequence of action that will minimize the overall cost over an entire trajectory. Um, 
So this is uh, very similar to uh, model predictive control, except that we don't uh, infer uh, a sequence of uh, uh, actions. We train a policy network to produce the action from, from the state. Um, and having the ability to kind of uh, generate multiple futures is absolutely essential. So uh, this system can be trained to uh, uh, drive uh, cars with uh, some level of reliability. So this is an example. The blue car here is driven by your agent. Uh, it's actually invisible to the other car, so it has to avoid getting squeezed. And uh, the white dot indicates the, the control uh, on the car, acceleration, braking, and rotation. Okay, con conclusions and conjectures. Uh, Self-supervised learning is learning dependencies. As I just said, there's a take-home message. Reasoning through vector representation and energy minimization might be a way to make reasoning compatible with deep learning and with uh, energy-based uh, learning. Uh, the main obstacle is dealing with uncertainty in high-dimensional continuous spaces. This is not a problem with NLP and BERT because we can discretize uh, the space. The space of uh, uh, words is, is discrete. But it is a problem in uh, high-dimensional continuous spaces like video. Um, so predicting points is, is insufficient. Predicting a distribution is intractable. So we have to resort to energy-based models. These are weaker than distributions. And we have two options to train those, contrastive methods and regularized latent variable methods. Uh, my money is on regularized latent variable energy-based models. I think those uh, eventually will uh, uh, overtake all the other methods. Uh, this is not the case at the moment, though. Uh, could energy-based uh, self-supervised learning be the basis for common sense? This is our best bet at the moment, possibly. Uh, animals and humans learn largely uh, self-supervised, and uh, scaling up supervised learning and reinforcement learning will not take us to human-level AI. Uh, and by the way, there is no such thing as artificial general intelligence. Intelligence is specialized, including human intelligence. It's very specialized. And so I think it makes more sense to talk about rat-level, cat-level, or human-level intelligence rather than uh, AGI. Thank you very much.